welcome to uh, one of the OPC's award winner uh, Zoom where they share their stories. My name is Patricia Kranz. I'm the executive director of the OPC. So today we're delighted to um, present a discussion with um, the winners of the David Andelman and Pamela Title Award for Best International Broadcast, showing a concern for the human condition. And it was won this year by um, NPR's Rough Translation podcast for a series called DIY Mosul. Um, and the, the head judge for this award was Doyle McManus, um, columnist for the LA Times in Washington. And he will uh, be having a discussion with them. We'll let them talk for about half an hour and then open it up to questions. If you have a question, please put it in the chat room and we'll, we'll take them one by one uh, after about half an hour. So welcome again and Doyle, I turn it over to you. Well, thanks Patricia and thanks uh, to the Overseas Press Club and also to my old friend David Andelman and, and Pamela Title for endowing this uh, prize, which is an interesting one, as you say. It puts a spotlight on pieces that illuminate the human condition. Uh, let me tell you briefly what the judges said about the, uh, the winning entry, and then we will get very quickly to the main event, which is to talk to the people who created it. Um, DIY Mosul, obviously meaning do-it-yourself Mosul uh, by NPR's extraordinary podcast, Rough Translation. Uh, tells, this, tells us a series of unexpectedly engaging stories from Iraq's second largest city, which of course was the crucible in Iraq of the war against ISIS. Um, Jane Araf and her team found uh, several independent civic groups who were doing work that the local government wasn't performing. They were clearing streets of corpses, rescuing books from a destroyed library, even uh, repairing the city water system. And these stories of grassroots civic action were told with uncommon sensitivity and insight into Iraqi culture. And the reason the judges loved it was this. Not only was it beautifully reported and uh, elegantly executed, uh, but it told us things about Iraq that even after decades of reading and listening and watching about Iraq, I think most Americans didn't know. We are, we are all used to seeing Iraq in a framework of war, of conflict, chaos, uh, sectarian strife. Uh, these were stories about uh, uh, ordinary Iraqis, or I should say extraordinary Iraqis, perhaps, because they were people who decided to pitch in and rebuild their city as volunteers. Let me also say a word, if I may, about Jane, whom I have known for several years. Uh, I was long ago a, a, a Middle East correspondent based in Beirut, but my, my tenure there doesn't hold a candle to Jane's. She has uh, produced one of the most distinguished and durable bodies of work in that difficult part of the world. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Jane, you arrived in the Middle East in 1991 uh, when you worked for Reuters. I am not going to do the calculation on how many years ago that was. <laughs> a lot, uh, a lot of years. <laughs> many years, many. Actually, as, as, as Arabs sometimes count, there is one, two, ten, and many. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, she has worked for, uh, for CNN. She was expelled once by the Saddam Hussein government. She covered the American invasion in 2003, covered the battles in Fallujah, Najaf, Samara, and Tel Afar, uh, covered Iraq for NBC News, PBS, the Christian Science Monitor, uh, now NPR, but very, very soon is moving back to Baghdad as the New York Times bureau chief there. So congratulations are in order to Jane for that news uh, as well as, as this prize. The New York Times, in its announcement of her appointment, said something you never hear the New York Times say. They said, we got luckier than we ever imagined. So that's another tribute to Jane. We've also got with us here 
uh, uh, Gregory Warner, who is the creator and host of Rough Translation, uh, Sana Krasikov, the co-creator of Rough, Rough Translation, who was one of the uh, editors on, on this piece, Michael May, uh, the uh, head of NPR's Story Lab, and, uh, and a field producer. So I hope everyone watching this podcast has given themselves the pleasure of listening to the piece. But just in case there are a few who haven't, Jane, uh, tell us about the story. Uh, tell us how you came across it and, and give us along the way a bit of a summary of, of, of what's in it. Thanks so much, Doyle. And, and first, I just want to say briefly how thrilled we were to be given this award and the idea behind this particular award, which is the human condition, because while it's deeply important to bear witness to conflict and war, it's what happens after really that I think tells us about a society and about people. So after the battle for ISIS, um, and that battle took a long, long time, the, the battle for Mosul, sorry, where US backed Iraqi forces drove ISIS out of Mosul took nine months and it was the fiercest fighting in decades in an urban setting. All sorts of civilians died, thousands of them, many of them in airstrikes that were targeting ISIS fighters. So when ISIS had been cleared out of Mosul, we were finally able to go in and walk around and there was almost nobody there. And not only was there nobody there, it was almost completely silent because either everyone was dead or they had fled. The trees were gone, the birds were gone, entire city blocks were destroyed. It was the most incredible destruction I had ever seen. And I've covered a lot of war, but this was just beyond belief. And we walked around, myself and our amazing local producer, Sangar Khalil, and thought, how does anyone ever come back from this? How does a, a city come back from this? And we kept going back week after week and people would trickle in, they would get permission from the military, they would go with civil defense forces and they would be looking for the bodies of their loved ones that they had had to bury in a garden or, or that they knew had been crushed in debris when buildings fell. And it just seemed almost impossible that this city could recover. But as we kept going back, we kept meeting people who were out there doing things and they were not government officials. They weren't UN people. They weren't aid organizations. They were people from Mosul and they were mostly young people. And they were doing things like giving money to people who were trapped so they could buy food, restoring electricity to houses that had where people were living in without power or water. There was this extraordinary young woman who was collecting dead bodies because no one else was doing it. And she was diffusing suicide belts. They were out there and they were doing things. So we followed two of them in particular, Sapwan Al-Madani, who created this wonderful organization, which translates basically as make it better or make it more beautiful. And a nurse named Sarur who um, insisted that she was going to be the one to go and pick up bodies and dispose of them and diffuse suicide belts. And it was against the backdrop of this city that for years had been held captive, not just by ISIS, but before ISIS by Al Qaeda. And then before that, it was never really stable, but it was this extraordinary city full of culture, but one you couldn't really get at. So when we went back, we basically were asking the question and I had kind of a vague idea and Greg took this idea and gave it shape and form. And really the thought behind it was, how do you come back from such immense tragedy? And, and what is it that makes a city survive? And what is it in people that allows them to go on? And what indeed makes things better? Um. Jane, thanks. Uh, Mosul is thought of in Iraq as an extraordinary city for a number of reasons, but were these people ordinary Iraqis, extraordinary Iraqis? Were these the great exceptions to the rule? You know what it was? I think part of it is this is a new generation. This is not the generation 
that lived under Saddam that holds that terror, the people that you would have met, that we've all met in the Middle East under dictatorships. They were Iraqis who grew up with internet until it was taken away from them by ISIS. They had opinions, they had thoughts, and they didn't have, despite everything, they didn't really have that fear. The other part of that was they had also grown up having the government do essentially nothing for them. They weren't expecting the government to come to the rescue. They knew they had to do things themselves. I think it's an example of ordinary people who, in, when tested, turn out to be extraordinary. But as one of our uh, one of the characters in there says, Safwan, who created this whole organization of volunteers, he said his goal is to make it normal for people to volunteer, to care about their neighbors, to do things. And, and that's really behind it too. They want to create a new society. But one of the extraordinary things about their stories is that they were also doing things that while in a Western sense, we'd look at it as normal civic volunteerism, were potentially dangerous. They were putting themselves in conflict or out of sync with, with, with local authorities from time to time. That's one of the great dramatic threads in the story. I, uh, I'm not going to spoil the story uh, 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 entirely by, by, by recounting some of the climactic scenes, but there is a dramatic arc, arc there that I want your editors to talk about a little later. My question is really a reporter's question. We all know how difficult it is often to get people to go on the record, to get people to go on tape, to talk about what they're doing. How difficult was it in this case? And were there other civic activists you would have liked to have profiled uh, who said, uh, no, thank you, I'm not interested? So I guess part of this is the beauty of radio in which you're not showing their face. Um, it's very intimate. You can get to know somebody, but you don't have to have them pictured, which gives them a certain anonymity if they need it. Uh, but apart from that, Iraq, as you know, is this fantastic place, like many places in the Middle East, where if you go down the street and knock on doors, pretty much every door they're going to talk to you. And in most places, if they have tea, they will invite you in for tea. I mean, imagine that happening in the West, for instance. It's just not going to. But there are people wanted to talk. And after Saddam, they were used to talking and they still have things they want to get off their chest. And but I think also there's an incredible generosity among people that generosity of being willing to share the most painful things to a reporter. For those who have listened to the piece, and you, you sort of fall in love with the characters as you listen to it, I have to, I have to say, because uh, they are remarkable people. Have you been back to Mosul since, and have you checked back in with the subjects of the piece? I have. Um, I was in Mosul about two weeks ago, and the city, the old city, the historic old city that was pretty much destroyed that we reported from, that the volunteers were trying to clean up and make safe again, looks a lot better. Um, there's electricity in most places. There's running water. There's even a lovely little cafe that's opened in the old city. Um, it's suffering, of course, from the pandemic, but due partly to these volunteers and, and kind of the, the cascading effect that they had, it does look better. Safwan, Safwan al-Nadani, who created this organization and leads teams of volunteers, and whose motivation originally was he wanted to make sure that there wasn't corruption, that money that was being given to help people actually went to people, um, actually joined the International Organization for Migration, a UN agency which helps resettle people, but he is still very much in charge of this organization and they are helping people rebuild their shops they are helping with the coronavirus because the hospitals are in really bad shape. So they're su providing supplies, medical supplies, all sorts of things. Um, Sarur, the nurse who was picking up bodies and diffusing suicide belts is still a nurse, but she also still runs volunteers and they actually volunteer in the COVID ward of the hospital. So it's kind of in their core. It's, I think it's part of their DNA these young people in particular. This is what they do. They help people. They volunteer. They make things better. 
and another of the threads, finally, uh, before I turn to your editors and producers, another of the threads in the piece is the love these people have for their cities. So let me ask about Mosul. Is Mosul back? Hmm. Mosul, Mosul is very much an idea as well as a reality. And by that, I mean people who love Mosul in the same way people love Baghdad or people love New York City, part of what they love about it is the shared history or their own personal history, the stories their parents told them, the covered market they used to go to when they were children. That part will always be there and it will always be deeply important to the people from Mosul. Um, it has a more promising future, but a lot of it, of course, because it's an Iraqi city, depends on what happens in the rest of Iraq. But there are parts of it that will never be restored. Um, archaeological sites, monuments, and of course, the biggest loss is, is the families. Entire families were killed. Thousands of civilians were killed. Let me turn now to uh, to Greg, to to Sana and, and and Michael, and let me start by taking a very long step back for uh, those viewers who aren't familiar with Lost in Translation. Tell us a bit, a little bit of the backstory of Lost in Translation. Where did it come from, and what's the guiding principle? Oh, yes. And, and actually, it's funny because Lost in Translation was our original title. So I think you've seen through to us, but Rough Translation is what we're... Uh, it's oh, in, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. Well, uh, but, <laughs> rough Translation. But but honestly, uh, sometimes I throw in Lost in Translation because it is more memorable. <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, no. Uh, can take you back to the beginning. Actually, it's interesting um, uh, thinking about... Well, thank you first for this award from the committee. And also, I just even listening to Jane just reminds me how what a pleasure it is to work with Jane on this. Even her answer about Mosul, which was about Mosul as an idea. I mean, you just don't get to hear that in, um, in a lot of reporting as to way, how people relate to their place. And I think uh, the idea fundamentally of rough translation was that we were gonna take these very intimate, not only storytelling journeys through places, but that we were going to see places through the eyes of the of the people there, and and really give it a sense of place that way, and and do that with the help of obviously people who are based there, correspondents, uh, as well as uh, uh, interviews, very in depth, intimate interviews with people there, and so the idea, the tagline we have is stories of uh, um, places far off that that hit close to home, that hit close to home really. Is, speak so because when you hear about something from somebody's perspective you know it's it doesn't feel far off anymore uh it feels like they're what they're struggling with is what what we are and so we started yeah technically in 2017 and and we're now on our fourth season of the, of the show and so how many how many pieces uh, per season does that turn out to be and and what what uh, staff of correspondence do you have to draw on well, the, the staff is easy. I mean, essentially we have NPR's uh, 17 international bureaus, which uh, and we have now because of coronavirus, uh, these Zoom calls with, the, with, with them. So it's kind of brought us all closer together and we chat about stories, which is an incredible opportunity. Uh, we also uh, report some stories ourselves and, 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 and get some freelance pieces as well. Um, the, in terms of seasons, actually also because of the coronavirus, we actually stopped stopped being seasonal, and we just we start. Even though I just said we were on our fourth season, um, we 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 now go every two weeks. So uh, we, yeah, so we're here. One of the amazing things about podcasting is that the, the, this piece runs almost forty minutes, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. It's yeah. got different moving parts to it. That's something you can't do even in what would have passed for long form on radio until uh, until relatively recently. How big a team did it take to put this together? Uh, we focus on Jane because she's the star, but uh, obviously mm -hmm. it takes a village. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I, I one of my favorite parts of the podcast, 
is honestly reading the credits because then we go start going through all the people who are involved down to the level of mastering and fact checking. So it's a very long list. Um, but in terms of those who were involved on it, we had, um, um, well, Michael May was, uh, I mean, you've introduced already, Michael May field producer. We also had a producer at Rough Translation uh, as well as somebody else who was producing. So we kind of three producers. Um, the main editor was Marianne McCune, also who was awarded on this award. Um, uh, Sana Krasikov was right here, uh, and she, and um, as well as as many other people who then listened to drafts, and it it kind of goes on and on. And so, talk a little bit about the process. How long did it take? Uh, it may be difficult to remember at this remove from conception to reporting to uh, to editing to production. I mean, Michael, I feel that, do, do you remember? I, I feel this took quite a while. Um, well, I, I see, yeah, I sort of start, well, just to tell you a little bit about my role. So I'm not actually on the Rough Translation team. I am part, I run a, a, the Story Lab, as you mentioned, and I um, accept call outs um, from from staff at NPR, and in fact, Rough Translation was one of the first uh, pitches I got. So I was there at the very beginning um, for the very first story that that Greg um, did for Rough Translation. We worked on together, and I think this one came sort of out of one of those callouts at the very very beginning. Jane had had written a, a a pitch that was totally different, and this is often. I will say um, hats off to Greg. When Greg gets his hand on an idea, he sees things often that other people don't. But um, Jane, I, I believe this sort of came out of a pitch you had given about your own experience wrestling with the destruction that you'd witnessed in Mosul. Um, and a dead body was, a, was in that pitch. Is this ringing a bell? It's been so long, but this is how I remember it kind of coming together. You had pitched a story about a young, a body of a young, what you assumed was a young ISIS fighter, that it was just, people were just walking around this body and it was sort of a meditation on, on that experience. Um, and you wrote a really beautiful pitch and I uh, brought it to Greg and we started to talking about it and you were like, you're really interested in this. We got you on the phone and it started, we started just peeling back and ended up, uh, well, I came obviously to, to, to Mosul and then we, we sort of identified these two. We actually interviewed a lot, of, a lot of other people as well. I mean, this is getting maybe a little off, but one thing when you said, are they ordinary people or extraordinary people? I will, you know, I had the benefit or, or the, I guess a different perspective from Jane in that I'd never been to Iraq before and certainly had all the kind of preconceptions that I think most people listening would have had about what Mosul would be like. And um, one thing that all just stood out so much to me and I'll never forget being there is that we went to this book festival. There's a scene from it in the story, but this voluntary spirit, it's true these were extraordinary, but it was very widespread among young people in Mosul and was so incredibly inspiring. It was so fun to have people be like, oh, you got back from Mosul just giving me this look like that must've been harrowing. And I was like, it was actually <laughs> inspiring. And people would just like raise their eyebrows. And I would start talking about this book festival. And I remember the first thousands and thousands of people showed up at this book festival. There were places like when they were giving out free books and stuff, you could hardly move. It was so crowded. Um, thinking about that now kind of gives me the worries. <laughs> but this was before coronavirus. Um, and, uh, and the first person that approached me was like a 20 year old. And he comes up and, and I'm just like, he's so excited to be at the book festival. Within a minute, he's talking about how he wants to start a hospital. It's like a 20 year old, like pre-med at college. And he's like, I'm gonna start, I'm, he's like, I don't wanna leave uh, Iraq to go to America or Europe. I wanna, I believe in my city and I wanna start a hospital. This is not someone who made it into our story. But I'm just telling you, this is the kind of spirit that we found in Mosul. So I, sorry, I just, felt like I should share that because it was just it's so, no, thank, so widespread for that. and I and so anyway so that's how I remember the the basically how this came about and how I got involved because I'm not involved with every uh I'm only 
that was probably only my fourth or fifth story that I've really been deeply involved with, with rough translation on. And, uh, and Sana, I, I, as, as I, I mentioned, you played an important role in shaping the story, in structuring the story. And it's, it's one of the things that's engaging about it, in fact, is, is how complex it is. It's built around two main characters, but there are three or four, perhaps five chapters in, in it, if you like. There is a narrative arc that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that carries the listener through and ends up illuminating the rather complex and subtle themes that, uh, uh, that the story is really about. So how on earth did you do that from the safety of North America? Um, well, there's, I mean, the big, I think for us, uh, the biggest challenge is that there's so much good material, the, the correspondence, and especially um, the, the, the material that Jane brought. Um, and what Michael was saying, there were actually other characters and other acts of volunteerism that was, sort of had to comb through because there was just such a wealth of um, amazing characters and amazing actions. And so I, I do remember it was, a, we were trying to decide if we could pull off doing this as a story of, of more than one character. And mm -hmm. I know you were really committed to doing both of them. Mm -hmm. um, you said that, you know, to really show the bigger picture of the city, you need both of these characters. So um, I, I I just I remember Jane just said um, that Safwan's biggest bigger goal was to normalize non-corrupt behavior, um, and it 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 recalled for me that um, kind of the a big difference between dramatic logic of a podcast and the um, kind of thematic logic of um, a piece of journalism is that they're somewhat inverted. And oftentimes the biggest idea doesn't lead, but sort of waits to the end. And um, I do recall, I mean, it's interesting you noted the five act structure because it really was, you know, the, the frame of Jane and then it was two turns for each of the characters. And then the second, I mean, I, I remember that second turn because I think it was like in a parking lot that it hit us when, Safwan was walking around uh, trying to connect these pipes. And until he's challenged by this um, man who wants his, the pigeons, um, <laughs> we don't actually reveal what his deeper motivation is. And that, I mean, it's all about really extracting the motivations of these people. And they're not, you know, there's the thing that they're doing, right? The, the act that they're, they're there, you know, and then there's what they really deeply want. And oftentimes, if we were to write it as a piece of journalism, you'd lead with that. He wants to normalize non-corrupt behavior. But sort of, I remember, we saved it to the end and kind of used the pipes as a metaphor for what's underneath the city that he's really trying to alter. Um, and that essentially became the second turn for him. So um, kind of it was not, and it was more challenging with her because we didn't have an ending until Jane brought us that end. Brought well, that until ending. reality happened. Yeah, until reality happened. Yeah. And that it struck me that really is one of the glories of this of this piece is that it seems to be narrative, and it's often about uh, sort of wonderfully ordinary things: water pipes, pigeons. Although in the context of of post-war Mosul dead bodies, uh, so a slightly surreal kind of, mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of, of normality, uh, but that the narrative in fact has embedded in it or hidden in it these, these larger, uh, larger themes and, and larger messages. That's, that's why I think it was so brilliant. Jane, uh, let me uh, come back to you for a moment. Um, what was it like being out in Baghdad working with uh, with these uh, uh, folks at long distance uh, as they shaped your work? It was great. Um, you know, pod, it was the first podcast I've ever done, and it's very different, isn't it, from from the kind of journalism we normally do. It's much, much, much broader and and. I had never done, and Michael May was um, with me in Baghdad, in, sorry, in Mosul for those, but I, I had never done interviews that went on for three hours. Um, that, it was a really interesting way to do things. I think for me, the beauty of it and, and 
part of the reason I love doing it is I learned so much about the craft and, and you all just crafted it beautifully and made me think about things in a way, I suppose in a deeper way that I hadn't thought about it. So it was, it was quite an amazing experience. A long distance is not great. You know, the time difference, the, yeah, all of that. Um, it's, it kind of takes a bit of a toll, but, but overall it was, um, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, are there lessons that you learned for your own work and are there lessons from this episode and then I'll want to ask it in a broader sense that that you uh, you'd like to pass on to other um, other foreign correspondents, other reporters in general, aspiring correspondents. Yeah, I think we have to recognize that we are extraordinarily lucky. We were extraordinarily lucky. Not only do we have amazingly talented people, we had the infrastructure where we could follow a thread. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time freelancing as well, and I see a lot of freelancers out there working so hard without the support, without the infrastructure, and it's so much harder. So for us, because you have to be really persistent, right? I mean, when the governor, who is a key part of this, who is trying to stop this young nurse from picking up bodies and threatened to arrest her, um, wouldn't talk to us, we basically had to stalk him. We, you know, we figured out where he would be. We talked to his security people. We waited for him. We went back over and over. So it reinforced to me the importance of being persistent. But to be persistent, you have to have an organization that backs you or you have to have some sort of support mechanism, I think. I, I would say the most valuable thing to do in a place like a post-war city is just to go and walk around and knock on doors and talk to strangers and just kind of soak it in and don't be too jaded, you know? I think what I had to fight was that absolute, that feeling like, oh my God, this is the end of the world. I mean, the destruction, the loss, the tragedy, the, the fact nobody was doing anything except these young people. But then there were these people who were taking extraordinary risks to make their city better. And I think without an open mind, um, maybe I wouldn't have been able to see that quite so much. And also, I know this sounds corny, but I, I think also with, you kind of need an open heart as well to believe that people can actually accomplish the kind of things that these people were doing because they really were extraordinary. They are extraordinary. Yeah. And one of the amazing things, Jane, is, is that you've been, you've been visiting Iraq and sometimes living in Iraq for, uh, for more than two decades. Iraq is a very difficult country. It's a difficult place to operate. Lots of things difficult about it, even, even when it's not at war. Um, and you somehow haven't become jaded what is what is the secret of your uh, <laughs> uh, 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 of your inner peace? Gosh, I'm not sure if I have inner peace, um, but I, I do feel sort of driven to keep telling these stories because, as you know, every you know, someone once said to me, an Iraqi, every Iraqi could write a book, or it could be the subject of a movie, is how I think of it, and they absolutely could be. You start talking to people in the street, and they have these extraordinary stories, stories that would completely leave most people undone if mm -hmm. one of the 10 tragedies ever happened to them. But yet they go on, you know, they get up in the morning, they take care of their kids, they go to school, they try to find jobs, they hold protests. They still have that belief that things can change. Um, I contrast that with another, another country I cover, Egypt, where that's kind of been knocked out of people. And in Egypt, when you interview a lot of people, you, you sense the fear in their eyes. That doesn't exist so much now in Iraq. And it is uh, what keeps me drawn to that place is that every time I go there and every person I talk to pretty much, I learn something and my eyes are opened again. Um, Greg, 
Sana, mm -hmm. Michael, what else do we need to know uh, about rough translation? Now that I've got the title right, uh, and and for those who have come across the podcast for the first time, uh, do you have any other episodes that you would like to direct people to, or even give us a sneak preview of what's coming up in the next few months? Sure. Um, uh, I'll start. I'll start just by saying. Um, well, just to piggyback off what you said about the extraordinary and the ordinary, and you mentioned that a lot of the things that happen in, the, in this story are, are fairly ordinary. Somebody wants to build some pipes and has an encounter about pigeons, I mean, not to give away too much. But I think that balancing the ordinary in inter international reporting is something that, is so, that we think a lot about at Rough Translation. So one of the, just to specifically with this piece, the more obvious place, say, to structure this or, or to start the story would be with um, with the nurse, uh, Saror, the character, who's facing something that's very surprising. Uh, dead bodies on the streets that kids are walking by. That's immediately very shocking. And uh, even there's a scene with the foot coming out of the ground and well, who's going to who's going to clear the foot? And that would have been sort of a, a place to start. But the reason we decided to start where we did, which is just in a supermarket with a water bottle on the floor, even though it caused quite difficult because it's a different character and we had to figure out how to introduce that character, but then make the other. But the reason we wanted to do that is because it is so ordinary. Um, it, you know, it's just it's just whether people will walk by a water bottle and throw it out or whether, choice point. whether, or the way they won't. It's a, and it's a choice point in the dramatic sense. Um, but from, from our perspective, it was also a way of saying, you know, it's actually an extraordinary moment because when someone throws a water bottle out in the place you are where you're listening, that's not a heroic moment. But here it's treated as a heroic moment worth applauding and being given chocolates and prizes. So why? why what is a, a place where even that small act of community um, service is treated as heroism? And then that would be the opening question of the piece, because ultimately what these characters are up against is many things, many things that we are familiar with from reporting. It is corruption. It is um, views on the roles of, of women in society. And yet, actually, speaking of the women thing, that is not as big a deal to Sarur's life because of the younger generation's attitude, as you might think. And so it's actually this deeper thing that, Jane was talking about, about the fear in one's eyes and the, the punishment for sticking your neck out in the past that does it apply to this new generation in the future. That's a very subtle idea um, that, we, that we explicate, but that was contained really in that opening anecdote, but in, in the balancing of the extraordinary and the ordinary. Um, in terms of upcoming episodes, I mean, look, uh, I always just have very short-term thinking. So we we uh, just released a trilogy that I'm very very proud of. It's called the School of Scandal, uh, and it's it's really it's about it goes to three different countries. Um, uh, let's see, China, India, and Uganda, where we are introduced to people who are um, breaking the status quo in ways that. Uh, you wouldn't have even known that that was the status quo was such. And and one of the challenges of our episode is trying to understand the of, of all our episodes is trying to understand the rules of a place and then how that character may be challenging those rules, breaking those rules, running up against those rules. Uh, and I think that that series uh, particularly does that. Great. And let me just second what what you said about that theme in, in, in the piece uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, this piece is not only about civic voluntarism uh, in, 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 in Iraq, but it's also about, and I found it as someone who had reported the Middle East, one of the most illuminating pieces I have ever consumed uh, in terms of the ordinary citizens um, very fraught, difficult, even dangerous uh, uh, relationship with government authorities, with the uh, es essentially uh, 
unlimited and always potentially arbitrary power of a police chief, uh, a soldier at a checkpoint, or in this case, the governor of entire of an entire uh, the city or the province. Uh, tell me if I've, I've got that right. But uh, the, so uh, it it um, it is a it is a subject that those of us who have covered authoritarian countries cover far too often in the abstract and by writing about it in these two individual cases it really brought home in a way what it is like to be an ordinary citizen confronting arbitrary power enormously powerfully i, I have a something to say about that i mean you know we've talked about how inspiring this story is and it is um these people are very, very inspiring. But I, I, I think if you think a little bit, basically just exactly what you're saying, if you, if you really look at the situation and the way that they're reacting to it, I think there's also really, you can really see the challenges that are facing these activists and the limitations in some ways of their vision. Um, and I, I know that's, uh, I don't wanna be a devil's advocate here, but there is, it's something that I brought up with them and have some very interesting conversations with them about that didn't make it so much into the piece, but they are so, so apolitical. They have, you know, Safwan in particular, I could totally see being an incredibly inspiring politician. He'll, just the mention of it, it's like he would recoil mm -hmm. with, with disgust. They don't have a vision for a political system that can work for the people. For, for a true you know, democratic vision of how you could rally the energies that they've sort of unleashed into that city into a way that will transform the public sphere. And that to me was deeply sad. I mean, if you look at the great you know, community organizers that of, in, a, in US history and, and the vision that they had to, to work with government, transform government for lasting change is not existent at all in this story. And so I think I would probably feel the same way if I'd grown up there, but it was uh, something where I kind of wanted to like, my brother is a community organizer. <laughs> I kind of wanted to get him on the phone and have him talk to us off on like, no, here's how you build power, man. Like, here's how you build power. What you're doing is great. You'll fix the water, you'll, you know, but working around the system of power is, is, is limiting. Um, so there's an interesting postscript as well, because the governor is the one who tried to arrest Sarur, and the governor is the one who held up a lot of things. And the governor is the one who didn't do anything about picking up the body. So um, just a few months ago, there was an arrest warrant issued for the governor for corruption. And he has, I believe he's fled. But even when we were interviewing him, he was like doing deals on the phone and he was on speakerphone and he was telling one of his aides at the time to make sure that he didn't approve any of the reconstruction contracts without his knowledge. It was extraordinary. And Shame. it was those little moments as well that, that said so much about what Mosul was like. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, it sounds to me like it's time for an epilogue in that case on uh, on, 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 on the governor and the, and the fact that he now has to flee. I want to mention that, uh, that, that David Andelman and, and Pamela Title, who endowed the prize, are, are in the audience. David uh, uh, put a, a note on the chat, which I will read to you. But uh, David, if you're, if, if you're listening and you would like to come in on audio, uh, uh, raise your hand and we'll make that possible. Uh, uh, David, who was a colleague of mine many years ago in the Balkans. Uh, when he was a correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, and he writes, it has been such a privilege for Pamela and me to endow this marvelous prize. Bravo to these brave and extraordinarily gifted NPR journalists. So thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much, David. Um, this really should be a chance for you not only to, uh, to, to, to get uh, uh, lots, of, uh, uh, lots of, of, of praise and admiration, but also to, to get in whatever, uh, you know, whatever, whatever points and messages you want. So I'm going to open the floor to you for, for uh, any other points that we should have made and haven't. I 
just want to make the point that I am in just incredibly gratified and humbled that people will um, that people will actually listen and care about you know people in Mosul about people a world away. It's just incredibly heartening, and I guess I'm always a tiny bit surprised at it, but it is a a truly wonderful thing, and, and maybe the moral there is that. You know, people love hearing stories about. I don't know why I screwed it up. How did I screw it up? Shit. You never now I'm gone. And there we go. And there's and we do have David Andelman on the line. I I, I recognize that voice. So no, David, David, we can hear you. <laughs> hey, David, we can hear you now. Well, we thought we could hear you. David, go ahead if you can hear me. Okay, can, can you hear me? We can hear you. I hear you. Oh, excellent. Okay. So, um, first of all, it's just such a privilege to, for Pamela and myself to have sponsored this award. Um, just to recognize your amazing work, Jane, and, and everybody else. But, um, you know, it really, there wasn't much uh, left after you listen to this extraordinary piece. Um, there wasn't much left in questions to ask. But I, I would like to ask a, a one, one interesting question. I'm, I've always been interested in context, especially in international journalism. I have a book coming out in January that talks a lot about that. Um, and, and one of the things I discovered in this course of research was that apparently 12 centuries before Muhammad, the um, epicenter of the Assyrian Empire was in Nineveh on the yes. banks of the Tigris outside what is today Mosul. And um, I'm just curious whether, I mean, it's been an extraordinary area for, you know, back to you know, back to 4,000 or more BC, there was the first, among the first um, human settlements were in that area. So I'm just wondering whether the people in that area are aware of their amazing history and the context and, and everything that they represented to, to the world, not only to their own vocation. They are, you know, that's part of the Iraqi sense of, of pride, I think. Uh, they realize that the, the streets they're walking on used to be the capital of a very powerful empire. It's sort of an abstract thing, I suppose, because if you look at, at Nineveh um, and Nimrud, the other Assyrian palace, you know, most of that is in museums and not Iraqi museums so much. And it's in the British Museum and, and the Pergamot in Berlin. People don't have a lot of access to their own history there, but it is still a very deep source of pride. And, and you can actually trace that incredible history from ancient Iraq to when Mosul was a cultural capital. It was Mosul and Aleppo. And Mosul was this incredibly city on, uh, city on the trade route. So it was rich, it was a commercial city, it was full of crafts, and it's always had an incredible cultural life as well. So in many ways, it's really a very special city. And as you say, with an incredible ancient history, yes, people do, I think, keep it as a source of pride without sadly being able to have much access to the part of it that was there. Has much of it been destroyed? Well, I guess much of Mosul was destroyed, of course, we can see that. Um, so I yeah, ISIS, ISIS destroyed um, the one of the main sites that's near one of the malls, oh, sorry, one of the walls of Nineveh. It also went into the museum where much of the pieces had been taken for safekeeping, but it still destroyed pieces in the museum. Right. Um, it, right. it destroyed also the minaret that was a, a symbol of Mosul. It destroyed one of the mosques. It, uh, yep, a lot of destruction there. So, so one final question, how are you going to, um, What's your next act going to be for the Times? <laughs> <laughs> how, how can you top this, I guess, for the Times? Yeah. I think, you know, what I'm really looking forward to is basically carrying on what I've been able to do at NPR, which is um, kind of dig into stories and dig into and get to know people and characters and, and find those people who are pretty much everywhere who just tell that amazing bigger story of a country that has reinvented itself like several times over since the US invasion and since Saddam Hussein fell. Um, so a lot of things I wanna follow, the Yazidis, um, the Yazidi religious minority that ISIS embarked on genocide against, the ability to cover the aftermath of a genocide in our lifetimes is just extraordinary. And I think deeply important, um, yeah. 
Oh, so many bra- stories. Very bravo. And, and keep up the great work. And we're Thank you so delighted much. we can Thank recognize this sort of thing. Thank you both for this wonderful award. Thank you. And I, David, I appreciate the, the word you use, context. I, I'm very interested that you're writing a book about that. I think that that's so much of what we talk about um, when we're thinking about episodes. There's another episode of ours uh, called War Poems about Afghanistan in which we learned that the Taliban is accessing an Afghan history of poetry going back quite a, going uh, going back, but but using that um, very effectively to to counter kind of modern American messaging. So um, understanding context is more than just uh, the work of anthropologists. It can literally be about whether you win or lose a war. Um, but I think too the question of context is what I, what I was what I love about this story in particular is that uh, so much so many of the stories we get from a place like Mosul are these snapshots usually the snapshots of of, of the worst moment in that um, in that city's history uh, and what was so exciting about working with Jane was that she had seen the long game over the ups and the downs like a person like a person like in fact like a generation who had grown up that way and so how does that shape that generation Jane had really watched them grow up and watched the experiences that had shaped them. And so that was a way we could get inside, you know, get inside people's heads and understand how they saw their their world instead of just seeing it from the outside in a moment of war. We've got a a good question over the Q&A from uh, Bill Holstein, an old uh, colleague of mine from UPI many years ago, who then uh, wrote for, was a foreign correspondent, wrote for Business Week and is now an author. And he asks, uh, you know, Mosul was known as sort of a melting pot in Iraq. It was partly Sunni, partly Shiite, partly Kurdish. How do those relationships work these days? Yeah, that's a great question. It's pretty much all Sunni these days. Um, That's one of the things about the sectarian war that followed toppling Saddam in that places became partitioned. And we allude to that actually in the podcast, the the perception that Sunnis, that the residents of Mosul who are Sunni didn't fight, that they welcomed in ISIS. And that that was a reason why the Iraqi government took so long to start the Battle of Mosul. That was the reason why there were so many civilian casualties. One of the most extraordinary interviews I've done while at NPR was actually at a panel in the Iraqi city of Suleimania. And I was interviewing the former Iraqi prime minister who had approved the battle plan for Mosul, which caused so much destruction. And we had documented through more records, through the cemetery, we had documented several thousand civilian deaths. I referred to them and asked him if he had been prepared for those when he approved that battle plan. And he said, well, no, there were only eight deaths. And I was stunned and I said, eight? And he kept insisting only eight civilians died in that entire city. A lot of residents of Mosul think that too is because it's a Shia led government. But one of the things you realize when you talk to people in Mosul is they're not that sectarian sectarianism in Iraq, I think, has pretty much mostly always been driven by politics, by money, and by other countries. And it's it's waned among Iraqis in general. Well, we are just about at the end of the hour. So uh, uh, let me uh, close by, again, congratulating you, Jane, and the entire team from Rough Translation. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Sana. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, thanks to all of those in the credits who, uh, who weren't with us today, but, uh, but deserve, uh, uh, deserve to share in the, in the joy and the, uh, and the recognition. Um, for those of you who have not listened to the piece, please go listen to it right now. For those of you who don't already have rough translation, on your list of regular podcasts. This piece drove me to rough translation and it's now on my regular podcast list. So I commend it uh, to all of you. Uh, And of course, thanks to David and Pamela for endowing uh, the the, the prize and thanks to the Overseas Press Club and, and Patricia for making it possible. And let me 
hand us back to Patricia. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Doyle, for uh, moderating such a fascinating conversation. And I also have to note that Rough Translation also won another of the OPC awards this year. So, so that's a double winner this year. So congratulations. Thank you. And um, so that's it. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.